On June 14, 1951, Remington Rand introduces Univac. Election year 1952. The Korean War becomes a heated campaign issue for Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson and Republican Dwight Eisenhower. November 1st, 1952. Here, a long plywood canal led to a tar paper shack called a cab. Inside was Mike, history's first hydrogen bomb. In 1954, Senator Joseph McCarthy investigated possible subversive activity in the Army. November 13, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled against segregated public transportation. Arkansas, September 1957, Governor Orville Faubus ordered the National Guard to keep black students from enrolling in Little Rock Central High. When the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik in October of 1957, the United States was thrown into a panic of defeat. Did, we did, the, then we did the, are you, am I on? Two out of three households had a telephone. You had a different ring. Okay. Like in other words, if, uh, if you had a two-party line, you had one type of ring. But if you lift it up, you could hear yes, on it, could like hear. it was an extension. So along comes the 50s. And uh, that was a great time for music. Uh, I happened to be in the music business at that time, and I managed uh, a couple rhythm and blue groups, that uh, rhythm and blues, which matriculated eventually into rock and roll. That was the early years of rock and roll. It was rhythm and blues. It was really music created by black people, and uh, it started to become more accepted by white teenagers and things like that, and that's what heralded in the 50s. Uh, and I was pretty active with that, and uh, I was at that time in college in Temple University. I grew up in the city of Philadelphia, in around the Germantown section. I lived in a row home. And I remember the, the lamplighter man that would come around the little ladder and he'd get up and he would light the wick in the lamp that so that the street would be lighted at night. I didn't see him in the morning, I only saw him at night. I remember that. I remember the 12 inch TV because we were the only ones on the block that had a TV and we had a magnifying glass in front of the TV. So it was bigger than 12 inches. And all the kids in the neighborhood, I had two cousins lived up the street, and a couple cousins lived around the street, and then um, the Mercado kids, they all would come, and we'd all watch Howdy Doody every day. We would watch Howdy Doody on TV. And that's what I remember there. The 1950s heralded in the uh, Korean War, and it affected this country uh, tremendously. Uh, to get ahead of my story, I was in college in uh, in '51, and the uh, towards the end of the war, the army had a big push and took all uh, students out of college. Uh, there was a uh, almost a mass drafting. And my grandmother and grandfather, they were great. They used to take chickens, lay on the cellar steps. I used to lay on the top there and watch them. They cut the heads off the chickens. The chickens would be running around with their head, blood squirting all over the place. And, and they just cleaned up. Then my grandmother plucked all the flat feathers off them and made pillowcases. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we had ate a lot of chicken. And our stove was a big black cast iron stove. It wasn't no modern gas yes, or, you know. They were great. We had that. Yeah, it was fun, a lot of fun. 
like I say, as we got older, things changed. You know, then I used to have to go to the store and pick up lunch meat or bread or whatever the case might be. And the store was right two doors away from the house. And I used to have to go and just tell him, this is for my father, Nick Ramo. He would sign the book. Then my father come and pay for it on Thursday or Friday. We got paid. You ain't nothing but a Most women were married by the age of 20. Yeah, absolutely, you're all made if you want. And then polio hit um, many households yeah. in 1952. Uh, it hit 50,000 people. Yeah, my before. father had lying out trains he bought starting in the 40s and he set them up every Christmas. Started at Thanksgiving up until the end of December. <laughs> they were up. It was great. They got two rooms. But that's what the fun days. I'm saying we're going back many, many years. It was a more innocent time, as we had said. A yes. far more innocent time. You could walk out your door, and as I say, because we lived... Uh, in row homes, and my generally my family was all around, but maybe on a different street or two blocks over or what have you. Just walk, you walk everywhere. Uh, and at Halloween, uh, you would make your own costumes and you would get big brown shopping bags, bags that they used at the, probably the grocery stores. And you go in and out of everybody's house, uh, and then you fill that bag and you bring that home, and then you get another bag and you go back out again and walk all around people you knew or you didn't know. Uh, there was a limit to where I was allowed to go, but I went by myself. Uh, Did you really? Or, or you would maybe start out with a group of kids, and then somebody, you know, they would eventually go fall off, or they would go up further, which was where it was. South College is now, or was it probably even then, uh, and I wasn't allowed up that far. That was too, too many blocks away. But um, yeah, I remember doing Halloween, and, and I don't remember anybody being with me. In 1953, the Korean War ended. 1953, because they were uh, negotiating with the North Koreans and the, the separation where they finally ended up was on what they call the 38th parallel. That's the demilitarized zone. And before that, that particular section, uh, we would push further north, they would push further south. And the army came to the decision to uh, draft, to double, quadruple the draft to get as many soldiers in to push them as far north as possible. So what they did, if you didn't have an A in college, you had from B on down, they dragged you out into the army. And uh, when the bus picked us up and took us down to Fort Meade, Maryland, which was a transfer station, uh, there were busloads of guys from Temple, which I was part of, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel, and so forth. It, just a huge uh, swelling of uh, future soldiers from colleges because they needed the bodies. So I was assigned as a, a combat medical aid man and for that training, they sent me to uh, Camp Pickett, Virginia. I have pictures here, but I don't know if you'll pick it up there. Uh, just pictures of basic training. We're standing there, uh, machine gun practice, uh, living in the woods on bivouac and things of that sort. Uh, that's in basic training. He went to basic training for 16 weeks in, in the United States. Then you were sent on a ship, a 4,000 man uh, passenger troop ship. That was the ship that I sailed on. And uh, that was, I think, about 15 or 16 days on the ocean until we got to Pusan, Korea. And when we got there, they loaded us on a troop train Pusan is in the extreme southern point of Korea. And we were going up to the northern part of South Korea, which was Seoul. 
and about every hour the train had to stop, the MPs had to get off, examine the track, the tracks in certain areas to make sure they weren't dynamited or they didn't have any bad guys out there. And every once in a while when it would stop, we would see, I don't know if you could pick it up here, you would see little urchins, they were orphans, who would come to the train track and beg for food because their parents were killed and they would live in boxes and hovels and things of that sort. But as devastated as Korea was then, there was nothing higher than a one-story building still left standing. And these are all pictures of the devastation to go further today, if you went to Seoul, Korea, you would think you were in New York City or San Francisco. It is absolutely unbelievable. And these pictures are, are what I kept in those days. Uh, I don't think you could pick it up and it won't do it justice, but uh, we, they were a backward country. They raised, uh, all their own food in, in rice paddies and uh, they fertilized it with human excretia and maybe that wasn't a smell uh, and that's the way it went. This was where I spent the first year and a half, I don't know, can you pick that up? That's called Yanggu Valley and that's all the way up north in Korea. and. Uh, there was no running water. Was, we had showers, but they would pump water out of a stream and things like that. And things got so, uh, things were so different for us. We came out of Philadelphia, and here we are in the mountains. And for over a year, we, we missed all the little things we take for granted. One time I had to go into Seoul and uh, a Jeep driver took me in and there was a Quonset hut <coughs> and they put some water tank on the top, pumped water in this water tank from a stream and they very ingeniously uh, had it a flow of water that when you flushed the toilet, it would actually flush. Whereas here there were, there was no toilets, there was outhouses. And I remember, it was about 14 months in Korea, I went over to this toilet and just flushed it. And then flushed it again. And it, it just gave me feelings, it made me homesick to flush a toilet. So that was the conditions. And uh, they were pretty rugged. There was sniper fire uh, because the president of Korea, his name was Sigmund Rhee, and if you look it up, you'll find what I'm telling you actually happened. Sigmund Rhee wanted the unification for all Koreans, so the prisoners that we had captured during the war, he one day let them all out. He had his army let them out. He didn't give them any food, any medicine, or anything, and he just let them find their way back up north. And in doing so, they had to steal food, steal medicine, and then it got to a point they were stealing, uh, breaking into our compounds, they were stealing our ammunition, and we were on duty because there was sniper fire all the time, and that, that, was, that was a little weird. So uh, we had that, and we also had the occasional, uh, we call the Charlie, Charlie's coming, which meant there's a plane coming from Korea just to take pictures of the front line and see if we were moving or in, a, in their direction. So whenever Charlie came, we had to jump into foxholes and just pray that he wasn't going to strafe us or, or bomb or anything like that. And that's during peacetime. <laughs> that's during peacetime. So that went on, and then my uh, I got a notice. Uh, we I read in the Stars and Stripes, which is a um, newspaper to this day. It's still a newspaper 
in the service that the morale was so low in Korea because the war had just ended and there's a natural habit of officers to make life difficult for the non-commissioned officers. You have to start polishing shoes, keep things extra clean uh, because you're not on maneuvers all the time fighting so they have to keep you busy and we politely call that in the army chicken shit. So chicken shit was abounding and the more it was the more this type of action continued just to keep soldiers busy the morale plummeted. So in the Stars and Stripes they put a request in for someone who had entertainment experience in the States. I looked at it and I had some clippings that appeared in Billboard magazine, the Daily News at the time, the Inquirer, uh, several other uh, literature. And uh, I found my way down to the proper person and they changed my MOS from a medical aidman to the head of special services entertainment of all of 8th Army. 8th Army covered all of Korea. And my job was to be the liaison between the USO shows and also to create soldier shows as well as bringing in soldier shows. Took Debbie Reynolds around and the first show we put on was in front of uh, 15,000 soldiers. You can't really see it, but here she is. Well, here she is. That was in the Stars and Stripes. Here she is. And I was the master of ceremonies. So I would be the one to coordinate all the activity and then to introduce the different acts. And in this show alone, there were 15,000 troops from uh, American, div uh, our division, uh, the uh, British, the Canadians, the Turks, and the Greeks. It w we had an army there. And uh, here, here I am standing. In fact, if you look on Debbie Reynolds' website, Debbie Reynolds during the Korean War, you'll see this picture with me and Debbie Reynolds on her website. Yeah, it's pretty nifty. Fifty years later, a buddy of mine tells me that she was appearing down at one of the casinos in Atlantic City. So we got a couple old army buddies and we went there. And this is her and me 50 years later. And I brought down some of the old pictures. And uh, just before she came out, I went up to the stage. I got a hold of the, her manager. I said, give this to Debbie and just tell her that I'm here. And she came out. I'll never forget it. My wife was there and some of my buddies from Korea. And this is 50 years later. And she came out with a thunderous applause for her. And she says, and she stopped the band. She says, please, please, before we start, I want to ask you and have you honor a Sergeant Ed Krenzel. Will he please stand up? And she says, hello, sweetheart. And she starts throwing kisses. She says, please let me see you after the show. And that was pretty terrific. And we did, and we exchanged old, old, old funny stories together. So it's, it's almost like a lesson in life. Uh, nothing can be all bad. Nothing could be all good, and that's life. So here is... A, a guy out of uh, South Philly originally and we had moved up to Logan and went to Olney High School and then pulled out of Temple University to not knowing what we were going to get into and uh, there were guys killed over there during my stay uh, and uh, they had um, uh, landmines mines that were on the roads that uh, were either never uncovered or some of these escapees stuck them in 
and there was enough sniper fire that you always heard about. But with that came some good times that I was fortunate enough to uh, take advantage of a situation where they were looking for someone that had what I believe I had talent for. And that's how I spent my, my remaining time in Korea and eventually uh, ended up in Japan. Our whole division moved over to Japan for, for some exercise and then came back to Korea. And then I got yellow jaundice. Uh, that was, there was an outbreak of dirty water and dirty food. And uh, it's something where you, everybody's walking around yellow. And luckily I caught it in time where only the, the whites of your eyes are yellow. They get you, and they get you in those days. The only way they knew how to treat it was to give you aspirin and very mild food and plenty of water. And luckily, I wasn't hit there. But there were some guys who, whose liver was damaged and it was, it was a mess. But that's part of everything. Right. Yeah. Um, when I, these are all pictures of soldier shows that I, I put out the word to uh, in the various divisions within 8th Army for people who had talent and there was an enormous amount of response from guys who knew how to sing, tap dance, tell jokes, the whole thing and we toured around the entire Korea entertaining the troops. And we got so popular doing it and the morale lifted so rapidly that uh, I was approached by the Turkish battalion, which I have pictures of, and uh, the other uh, coalition forces to entertain them as well. So what we did, we invited them and, and enlarged the seating. It wasn't really seating, they were, you had to pick out a mountain slope. <laughs> That's where we had it, on mountain slopes, and you had to get the proper kind of shape. So we would throw together a quick um, uh, uh, stage, a quick stage, facing a particular area, and we would approximate, yeah, this could hold 20,000 troops, this is what we'll do. And that's the way it was. Uh, so after about two years, uh, I made uh, staff sergeant in 17 months, I was fortunate, uh, which means, and only a GI could appreciate this, that you ate better food. You ate better than a private. And uh, you were a non-commissioned officer, so you ate with the officers. And it was interesting, in the Army, you're disciplined where they tell you what to do, and you do it to the best that you can. And after I settled down in the Army, I got to enjoy it, because I, uh, I, I was able to, frankly, do my own thing. Yeah. And I remember the day, that the last day in the Army was in Fort Sheridan, Illinois. And there was about, that would be about three, four thousand guys being mustered out that day. And you were in formation, and there were captains in front of you, and they reported to a colonel, and they reported to the general. And the general was saying goodbye to all these troops. And then when he would call out, company, the colonel said, company, and the captains would say, company, and the sergeant which I was in charge of that particular company, I would call out company and then I, I would yell, attention. And then they said, dismiss. And I said, dismiss. And no one moved. And I didn't move. And I'm looking on either side. Here are thousands of troops not knowing what to do, because no one's telling them what to do. And we all stood there, it seemed like minutes, 
and then finally we started to mill around and now you go find a train and go back home. I'll never forget that feeling. Instead of being told what to do, we were dismissed and we just stood there. <laughs> that was something. <laughs> Um, do you remember the padded uh, step stools in the kitchen? The metal, metal step stool? I remember them, not that I have one. We did. It was red. It, it was, yeah, it cost $9.66. Oh my word, that would be a lot of money for that at that time. The, in actually in 1954, Marlon Brando's uh, popular movie was oh, on the waterfront and the wild one. Yes. And the best song was Rock Around the Clock. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. In uh, 1955, the minimum wage jumped to a dollar an hour. In 1955, the first McDonald's opened. 1955, Coca-Cola now sold coke in the cans. Mm -hmm. Up until then it was always the bottles. Uh, and then popular movies were in 1955 was Elvis, Bill Haley and the Comets, The Platters. You remember The Platters? Yes, I right? sure Love do. The Platters. Men's styles in 55 were pink shirts and oh. charcoal pants. Oh. And then Elvis came out with a song, Blue Suede Shoes, mm -hmm. and all the guys got blue, blue suede, suede shoes, shoes right? But don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Well, you can do anything but take me over my blue suede shoes. Well, you can knock me down, step in my face, slander my name all over the place. Well, do anything that you want to do, but uh, uh, honey, lay off of them shoes and don't you. Step on my blue suede shoe. It was hard for this kid to go back to Temple University. When I, I went back and I hung out there in Mitten Hall and I saw these other kids and they looked like uh, ninth graders in, in high school. Uh, for what we were through, what, what I experienced, I just couldn't relate to it, I couldn't be in that environment. Uh, you're jumping in and out of foxholes when the enemy is coming over, not knowing what's going to happen next. I just passed on it. And in those days, they said, well, you have to go to college, just like we say today, uh, because you can't get a job. Well, I already had that figured out. I'm going to create a job. I have an organization where I employ 70 people. They all went to college. Uh, and we do pretty good. So the rest of the 50s was devoted in and out of different trying out business, trying to hone my skills, things of that sort. At one point, along with two other people, I acquired a, um, well, we were in the record business for a short time, but that was before the Army. And uh, for reasons of our own, we didn't want to go back into the record business because handling and managing entertainers, whether they be white or black, was a killer. If you said, uh, listen, we have to be in, uh, in Center City, Philadelphia, we're recording a record at two o'clock, you, you would have to pray that they showed up that day let alone two o'clock. So it was uh, too much aggravation along those lines. But in the latter part, um, went into uh, controlled businesses and, uh, and matriculated through it, learned a lot, had some fallbacks, had some successes, just like anything else in life. Uh, but in the end, uh, I've learned that just like in anything else, if you prevail, and you have the discipline of perseverance, you're going to come out. And I, I speak in the different schools uh, on Veterans Day, along with other members of the Veterans of Foreign War, 
and they usually ask me to give the perseverance lecture, which I just gave you a little piece of just for a second, but I end up by telling all the students, here was World War II. The Nazis were bombing and killing Britain. They were decimating thousands, thousands of people every month, killing them, ruining their home, no place to live. Hospitals were being bombed. And Hitler was going to annihilate England if it wasn't for one guy, one guy, Churchill. Winston Churchill. Do you know Winston Churchill? Well, if you read Winston Churchill, he's my hero. Uh, I remember when he was alive. I remember when he gave a famous speech, and I do this in the high schools and in the elementary schools. He says with his low English voice, and I remember hearing this, The Hun, the Nazis, are bombing us. My own party wants us to surrender. They want to capitulate. They want to allow Germany to come in like they did into France. He says, we will fight them from the hills. We will fight them from the alleys, from the fields, from the airfields. We'll fight them from the streets. We will never Never, 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 and he says this four times, surrender. And they didn't, and the whole thing reversed, and we beat the crap out of them. Well, since my baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. In 1956, um, education became uh, very important. Mm -hmm and mothers uh, can now buy disposable diapers. Teflon frying pans came out then, in 1956. Oh, uh, the epic movie in 56 was The Ten Commandments. Let my people go. The slaves are mine. Their lives are mine. All that they own is mine. I do not know your God, nor will I let Israel go. And that year, Grace Kelly married Prince Rainier. One out of three high school graduates went on to college. Mm. I, because what you had read off where one out of so many went to college and what have you, I wanted to be in medicine. I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, my mother didn't think that I should be a doctor. She said, if you like it that much, be a nurse. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to be a nurse because I don't want to be a nurse. I'm going to be a doctor. So um, that wasn't going to pan out. So over PW, at a certain grade level, you had to make a choice if you were going to be commercial or academic. Academic when you were going to high school, uh, to college. So I took the commercial course, which then prepared me for secretarial work. So that was my background, and I was good. My friend, my very best friend, Dottie Sessler, who was my maid of honor at my wedding, we were so competitive with shorthand and typing. She, I do think she was better than me, but I was really close. We do over 100 words a minute and took all that. I was good. I was really good. So I had good credentials to go get a job, and I graduated, uh, and I remember if it wasn't like maybe the next day, it was the day after graduation, I got out my aluminum folding chair, put my suntan lotion on with my baby oil and iodine, and I was going to go out and sit, get a nice suntan. When my mother kept calling, and we didn't have cell phones, so I'd have to get off the chair, go in the house, answer the phone, she wanted to know if I'd gone out and look for a job yet. I, I one mean, day. One day. That whole, she, all she kept saying, did you get a job? So she took it upon herself to look for employment for me. So I went to this place, something federal something or other. It was a friend of her boss's. They were interviewing hiring. And I want to tell you, I couldn't do shorthand, and I didn't know how to get the typewriter to work the correct way. And the guy looked at me and he said, well, what are your interests in? Uh, and I said, well, I don't know. I, uh, do you need a point? And, oh, well, what was the last book you read? 
And I said, well, I'm reading, you know, Rasmussen, the man, Russian. He said, you're reading that book? He said, and you failed that test? And I said, mm-hmm, I guess. And he said, well, I'm not hiring you. And I said, mm-hmm, okay. I didn't want that job. I, I didn't want that job. So I got my own job at a pharmaceutical company. And I had to go into Chestnut Hill, park the car, get on the trolley, take the trolley to some place, took another trolley to the pharmaceutical company. But the reason they hired me, outside of my outstanding qualifications, was they were moving to King of Prussia. And so I went, I did that for, I don't know, a couple of months. And then they moved the pharma, Abbott Pharmaceutical and they moved out to King of Prussia. And then I just drove car yeah, King to King of Prussia. I do remember going back now, I remember when Elvis was appearing on the Ed Sullivan show. Mm -hmm. And his gyrations were, you know, horrible and banned and what have you. <laughs> Rock and roll. Take out the papers and the trash. Or you don't get the Budnick launched in 1957. In 57, the most popular toy was the hula hoop and the slinky. My mother was a crossing guard, like I say, and she walked around the side there and she and me smoked on her. I said, okay, don't tell daddy. <laughs> Open up a honey, it's your lover boy, me that's knocking. Anybody who earned about $3,800 in 1958 was considered uh, upper class, <laughs> right? They were considered well off. Cars continued to get bigger and heavier and larger in in Great big white wall tires. Oh yeah, pimpmobiles, I had one of them. Popular films were South Pacific, Vertigo, Bridge Over the River Fly. And in 1958, that's when Toyota and Datsuns go on sale in the U.S. for the first time, 1958. And polka dot dresses are the rage. I was 16, 17 years old, started driving. Used to go out and do drag racing on the weekends. And I wasn't supposed to, because my father didn't know what I was doing. And my father found out and put a real damper to it, so I had to stop. So, while I was living at home. But when, after that, I was continuing drag racing. They're the fun things I had. Crazy when you deal on the street drag racing because everybody thought they had a faster car than any other. And that's what it was. And that's what it was. It just there was no set thing you're going to do. It wasn't grudge match. No, it no. It was just you had the you claimed that you had the quicker car and you went all over the place. You went on Lafayette Street, Washington Street, up on DeKalb Street, from. Uh, Branch Street. Oh. Well, what did you do? It meet another guy and he we, would no, challenge you? No, we were at Gino's and it was just a hangout. We were like another car and that's what we did. Who had the fastest car, etc. Okay. And then we stayed and there and we would meet on the Washington Street. There was always like midnight on. There's those early morning hours. Uh, and then the word would get out and the people would watch, right? Oh, yeah. It was cool. yeah. A lot of spectators. But I don't remember. I don't remember a whole lot of them. We used to go up on the expressway. We used, yeah, used to have guys get on and country hopping and just back the traffic up. We would get on and the next exit to get on knew where the quarter mile was. So that like, he held up all that traffic until you had that whole stretch. Oh, wow. Like, it was kind of the crazy thing he did. And the cops got some more to us. Maybe yeah. they're weak. Did you ever get caught? No, we were able to run. Got a bunch of my friends. We got on the train in Bridgeport, yeah. and we went to New Haven because they had Connecticut Bandstand. And after oh. school, we used to watch Connecticut Bandstand, and then Who the was Philly. the MC on Connecticut Bandstand? It was just just a local was yokel. You, what was this in the English? Did you go with Bob Horn, or was it Dick Clark? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Dick Clark was oh. on Philadelphia. Oh, okay. But we used to watch, after Connecticut, we would watch Philadelphia. But for my 16th birthday, we all went to New Haven to Connecticut Bandstand. And Bobby Darren was there. Oh. And I danced, he danced with me on the television to Splish Splash. <laughs>
59, the uh, TV shows that were popular were Bonanza, Rawhide, The Twilight Zone. Movies uh, that were popular were Some Like It Hot and Ben-Hur. Oh, okay. And uh, in that year, Alaska and Hawaii were taken in, into yeah. the United yeah. States, part cool. of the Union. Movie tickets were a dollar. First pictures of Earth were taken from space. Then we had the labor relation every Friday night was where the dancers were. Mm -hmm. Used to be a packed house, so we go down there and have a good time. I went to Friday night dances with the girls. We had a set pack of friends, uh, and we all would, uh, they would come to my house a lot, and we would practice all the dance steps, whatever it was. The Calypso was one dance, and then there was the Bristol Stomp. Yeah. That was yeah one. That was the cha cha cha. Yeah, yeah. Cha, right. Cha cha cha. We did the cha cha cha. I tried to teach Nick how to do the cha cha cha. Uh, and, uh, and and I don't know if it was in Philadelphia only. It certainly was within my family. So all my cousins were dancers. They all loved to dance music. My aunt Dot cleared her. Um, dining room in the city it was a you walked up the steps you walked into the living room the dining room and then off over here was the kitchen she cleaned out her whole dining room and she set it up for the kids to dance uh, so everybody in my family liked to dance and it, we would practice a lot of dancing over there and it was a dance you would you would start out and back and forth and then you would twist around but there was a certain movement of the arm you would push like this and then push like that and dance all around and it was it was a timing thing uh, so we practiced that a lot we did that a lot so Friday nights were dances at the Labor Lyceum on Ridge Pike which is now the road to Home Depot um, and the girls would all go you would put your makeup on and build out your hair remember how big the hairdos were back then and what have you all that spray net uh, and you would, we would, somebody's father would take us. A lot of times my father took us. Most of the times he did, but somebody's father would take us. But they were over at 11, Nick? Yeah. They were over late, so there wasn't too many fathers that stayed up to take you home. So you always said you were going to get a ride home. So you always hoped that some guy was there was going to take you home. Well, we were on our way to Lover's Lane. I missed a turn and rolled the car over with my wife in the car. We weren't no, married at the time. Not, you're not she still has stitches time. in her head. <laughs> uh, which was a... Uh, where is it now, Nick? It was a windy thing yeah, around... River, river thing, yeah. That, remember that at the end, it went around yeah. and up to the top, and then it was flat on the top. Yeah, like and then that. all these cars would be parked there, and they would all be foggy and smoked in and we couldn't see them. But then the police found out about it, yeah. and then they would come and flash the light on you and break it up and tell you, you know, go home. Everybody go home. Down by the river, don't you know? Where a cement bag just drooping on down. Oh, that cement is just, it's there for the weight.